Hello, I'm Mario Guillén. I'm a professor at the Wharton School, and today I'm having a conversation with Mohamed Elarian, who is a professor of practice at the Wharton School, senior advisor to Allianz, senior fellow at the Lauder Institute, and the former CEO and chief investment officer at PIMCO. Mohamed, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you. So yesterday, uh, you gave a wonderful analysis of the situation in the economy, the global economy, regarding COVID-19 to our students at Wharton. Uh, and uh, you talked uh, at the beginning about the what of the crisis. Could you expand on that? Yes, Mauro, with pleasure. The what is unprecedented. It's a virtual standstill of the global economy. If you've lived in a fragile economy, if you've lived in a failed nation, if you've lived in a community hit by a natural disaster, you know what that's like. But we've never seen a sudden stop of the economy at the level of a big country, let alone at the level of the world economy. And associated with that are three important inconsistencies that we need to reconcile over time. The first one is between health policy and the way the economy is wired. For the right reasons, the current stage of health policy is about separation, it's about social distancing, it's about isolation. But our economy and our society are wired for the opposite. And with health, of course, dominating, the economy gets to a sudden stop. The second inconsistency is between individual behavior and collective behavior. And finally, we have an inconsistency between what countries want to do nationally and what the global responsibility is. So what you get with that is a virtual stop. My worry, Mauro, is what happens if, God forbid, this virus spreads in a big way to the developing world, that would be even more tragic in terms of human toll. And then the last bit of the what is the interaction between the economy, where the crisis started, and finance. Unlike 2008-9, it's not finance that started the crisis, it's the economy. But now finance also has come under pressure. Yes, and you also uh, lectured yesterday about uh, the initial conditions, um, you know, uh, how the global economy was doing before the crisis. Uh, you mentioned, uh, for example, that there is a decoupling from fundamentals. Uh, could you comment on that? So we entered this crisis with the wrong initial conditions. So what do I mean with that? Three things, really. One, we had financial markets decoupled from the underlying fundamentals. Financial markets were up here, elevated. The economic fundamentals were down here, sluggish. So when we had the shock, of course, you got a very sudden retracement of financial markets that added to the sense of uncertainty and unsettlement. The second element is we've come in with a very period of what, what I've called new normal growth, very low growth that was insufficiently inclusive and didn't pay enough attention to sustainability issues. And finally, we came in with policies lacking what I call spare tires. Deficits were high, indebtedness was high among the corporate sector, central bank balance sheets were already high. So these weren't the best initial conditions to give us the sorts of resilience you, you would like to be able to navigate such a major shock. I see. And how about the how? Uh, so you also um, lectured uh, yesterday about uh, the how of this crisis. Um, could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, what's, what's interesting about this crisis, it's a simultaneous destruction of both consumption and production, of both demand and supply. And when you get both getting hit hard, they feed onto each other. So the airline industry is often put out as the example, and some people think of it as the exception. It's not. It simply happened to be the leading indicator of what restaurants have felt, what barbershops have felt, hairdressers, virtually every segment of the economy. And it goes something like that. Either for reasons of health caution or because people are mandated to stay at home, people consume less of something, less travel being the leading example. 
as they consume less travel, companies see a massive hit to revenue, something way outside anything they ever imagined. What's their reaction to cutting to revenue falls? Cutting cost. What's the quickest way of cutting costs? Laying off people. So you lay off people, but these people, in turn, are consumers. So we have seen the mo biggest hit, and I'll give you one indicator that troubles me enormously. In just three weeks in the United States, the last three weeks, unemployment has gone up by 17 million. So to put it into context, 17 million is over 10% of the labor force. So unemployment has moved, the change in unemployment, 10%. The highest level during the Great Recession of 2008-9 was 10%. So in three weeks, we have gotten already to the level that we reached during the Great Recession. And unfortunately, unemployment is going to go higher. A lot of people are saying maybe 20 to 30%. Yeah. In what ways is the financial part of the economy part of the solution this time around? So the good news is that the crisis didn't start in finance. And the other good news is that the banks want to be part of the solution. They don't want to be, again, part of the problem. Why is that important? Imagine you have a viable business. Imagine that you are running a very popular restaurant. And just for now, you can't open it fully. You are having what's called a liquidity crisis. The minute that people can re-engage in the economy, they will come back to your restaurant. So you having what is a temporary and reversible problem. You go to your bank and you say, look, I'm having this problem. My rent is fixed. I have lots of fixed costs that I need to meet. Can I, may I please have a loan? If the bank says yes, it allows you to bridge over this tricky liquidity crisis. If the bank says no, you go bankrupt. So your liquidity problems becomes your solvency problem. So the finance side will have a very important role to play in helping communities bridge through. And the good news is that the government and the central banks have realized that they need finance to play an important role as part of the solution, and they are helping this process. Yes, and that's, uh, of course, a very different situation from uh, 12, uh, 12 years ago. Uh, now, finally, in your lecture, uh, you um, explain to the students uh, what uh, may be coming uh, further down the road. So the what next of this crisis? Tell so us a little bit about, about that. Yes, think about two elements of the what next. And they come really after we've, we've gotten our arms around the health issue. And getting our arms around the health issue is about first and foremost being able to contain the spread of the virus, better identification, better understanding of what it is, treating the ill better, and hopefully increasing immunity, either through a vaccine, which would accelerate everything, or through some sort of community immunity. At some point, governments are going to feel comfortable to restart the economy. And they're going to discover something, Mauro, that I think is not well understood as yet. This is not 2008-9. 2008-9 was, as we just discussed, a financial crisis. A financial crisis is like a heart attack. It hits you hard. It hits at the heart. If you don't deal with the heart, everything else stops. And what's underneath a financial crisis is a counterparty crisis. People don't trust each other. So the paddle, if you like, for the heart attack is a central bank coming in and saying, I have a printing press in the basement. Trust me. And that works. What we're going through now is an economic sudden stop. And they are different. They start small. And then they cascade and reach critical mass. So instead of dealing with a heart attack localized in the heart and catching it before it destroys everything else, you're dealing with a broken leg and an infection in one leg. You're dealing with an infection in another leg. You're dealing with an infection in an arm, with another arm. It's a multi-symptom 
multi-aspect disease. And the restart is not instantaneous. So the restart is not going to be like flicking a switch. So we have to think very carefully about how restarts are sequenced. What does it mean for the winners and the losers? And then once we get through that process, I believe, Mauro, and this is a hypothesis, that the post-crisis landscape is going to look very different. We're going to emerge with this with much greater entanglement of the government in the private sectors. Lots of industries are going to be bailed out under what conditions we don't know as yet. There's going to be a lot more debt in society. People are likely to put resilience in front of efficiency. That's particularly true for companies. They've learned a lesson now that it really does matter when your, when your supply chain is completely globalized. It may be efficient, it may be cost effective, but it's not resilient. And we're going to have a lot of other issues that we're going to have to deal with. So the what next is not only just a restart, which I believe is going to be tricky, but also a different landscape. Yes, and uh, do you anticipate that the generation, uh, especially the younger generation that is now experiencing this crisis, will behave in a different way farther down the road, the same way that the generation of the Great Depression, let's say, was also very different from either the preceding generations or the ones following it? I do, and I, I think especially so if the duration and the severity of this shock is very large. Um, but this issue is, is under a lot of debate. I do believe that we as a society are going to become more sensitive to tail risk, more sensitive to these events that have very low probability but are highly consequential. And that is because we've just gone through a massive experience. The behavioral scientists will tell us that once you get taken out of your comfort zone in such a violent and sudden fashion, it does change how you behave. So I do think that both companies in stressing resilience over efficiencies and households in trying to build up better cushions to navigate a shock are going to be more frugal. And we, it will look, it will remind people of the Great Depression society. So that frugality perhaps uh, will, for example, help us increase the savings rate or may bring about some, some good outcomes, uh, uh, would you say? Over time, yes. But remember that you have to deal also with restarting consumption at a high level. We will need to put a lot of people back to work. We will need to reopen a lot of businesses. And they need consumers. So it's the two, the two side. On the one hand, yes, you want society to be more resilient. You want people to self-insure. That's what that is. Everybody will self-insure more. But on the other hand, self-insurance is actually economically inefficient in the short term. So we've got, to, we've got to strike the right balance. And I remind people over and over again, let's not to re repeat the mistake of 2008 and 2009. In 2008 and 9, we won the war. It was a war against the Great Depression. But we lost the peace. We did not secure the peace. And what was the peace? It was returning to high, inclusive, and sustainable growth. This time around, we are fighting against the war, the same war, a Great Depression. I think we're going to win this war, but it is equally important to secure the peace. We can't afford to not win the peace. If we don't win the peace, we will have a multiple of the economic, social, political, and institutional problems we had coming out of the Great Recession. Okay. Uh, so on that note, uh, Mohammed, thank you so very much for sharing with us your analysis and your wisdom. Uh, this was Mohammed Elerian, Professor of Practice at the Wharton School, Senior Advisor to Allianz, a Senior Fellow at the Lauder Institute, and the former CEO and Chief Investment Officer at TIMCO. Mohammed, thank you again. Thank you very much.